So I'm going to start. Hello everybody, uh, welcome to our session to the rest of the world around co-production and transdisciplinarity. Uh, I say welcome from Future Earth Finland, Future, uh, Future Earth Europe, from the Transdisciplinarity Network in Bern and the European Alliance of National Committees. Uh, on your screens you can see uh, Tanya Suni, uh, Ina Koskina, um, myself and uh, Tobias Busa. Uh, they're your speakers today. I'm going to, to take you through uh, from some of the conceptual background through to um, some of the uh, case studies in, in Finland. Um, also including some uh, materials around communication as well. We will, I will ask you for questions at each of the, uh, at the end of each of the speakers that specifically addresses those talks and those speakers and then at the end we will have a big discussion um, all around this uh, vast and, and wide topic. And the purpose for these webinars, this is the first one we've done in this series, it is exactly that, it is one of a series. We are putting the background and the interesting, uh, useful information to a workshop, a physical real-world workshop that we will have in Stockholm 22nd and 23rd of November, which will um, perhaps focus more on, on pra practice. Um, so uh, that's about um, that's about it from me, and I'm just going to say because not all the names are here that that we know. Um, so if you're new to Future Earth, the Future Earth is a global coalition, a network of organisations working together to coordinate or better coordinate global environmental research towards sustainability. Um, I'm just having a difficulty with, ah, there we go, sorry, I've just been trying to record it, and so now this is being recorded, so uh, the only person to swear should be me. Um, so uh, we're, we're, we're live now. So now um, I will uh, hand over, first of all, to uh, Tobias Busa um, from the Transdisciplinary Network in Bern. So I'm now going to make you the presenter, Tobias. And let's make you the presenter. There we go. And I'm going to uh, mute and switch off the cameras of the other speakers um, because they'll all be back later. Hello. Do you see my presentation and hear me? Yes, is the answer. Okay. I see the presentation okay. and I can hear you and I can see you too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So. Welcome everybody, nice to speak to you. Um, I'm Tobias Buser, my background is Geography and Environmental Science and I'm since uh, about eight years supporting projects in designing their transdisciplinary processes and also designing and facilitating, moderating um, workshops uh, with stakeholders a lot. So this uh, presentation is about transdisciplinary research, just a short introduction to give, give you some ideas. So what is transdisciplinarity? Well, there are quite some, uh, a bunch of definitions, but I will try to describe it shortly, what it does. Um, transdisciplinary knowledge production it's not only aimed at scientific knowledge production, but it aims at societal problem solving. So it's not only producing knowledge on systems, on problems, but it also uh, aims at producing knowledge for s solutions, for um, transformations. So close interaction with societal actors that can take decisions, actors that can act, actors that are affected in the respective field of your um, project, these are stakeholders, so interaction with these stakeholders is key. It's well known that there is a um, quite a gap between the knowledge uh, generated by science and action taken in society, so to overcome this gap um, in Transdisciplinary research we include stakeholders already from the beginning, from finding the topics that are really um, 
interesting too for stakeholders. Um, then interdisciplinary research we're also dealing with normative questions, with target questions, where do we want to go, um, what are good solutions, what are solutions seen as no-go and so on and the discussions of this and it's also about the co-producing the knowledge how to reach then these targets. So in one sentence one could say um, a transdisciplinary research process links societal problem solving with scientific knowledge production in a process of co-producing knowledge. I'm trying to get to the next slide. Okay, so uh, what are the principles of transdisciplinarity? There are um, four of them. One is to grasp the complexity of problems. This uh, usually leads that um, to to involve several disciplines because usually problems are more complex than one discipline can just grasp. Then it's very important to take into account the diversity of life world, that's the stakeholders' views and the scientific perceptions of problems, goals and solutions. So here the stakeholders come into the view. It's also important to link abstract and case specific knowledge in the one direction. It's um, when working with stakeholders it's about contextualizing also the, the knowledge and on the other hand for stakeholders it's about linking their um, case-specific knowledge with uh, more abstract bodies of scientific knowledge. And another important point is that um, transdisciplinarity aims to develop knowledge and practices that promote what is perceived to be the common good and strive to develop solutions to what is the common good. This could mean, for example, that when doing uh, research in medicine, um, that you do not only work with, uh, with uh, pharmaceutical <coughs> concerns, but also with the patients and the um, medical personnel, for example. So, when is the transdisciplinary research approach suitable then? Um, generally said, it's when societal problems are addressed and when you are aiming to contribute to problem solving and transformation and not just to system knowledge. So it's especially for complex, wicked, um, contested problems where transdisciplinary approach is suitable. But now about the interaction with the stakeholders, how intense should that be? And this is um, very much depending on the project's goals and starting conditions. Can't go here in t into deep, um, but that's something I think for the workshop we could go then. But I'll give you an idea of how I group the intensities of interaction. Um, the least intense form of interaction is information. Um, could be one-way information where it's basically no interaction, you just inform, can be information with the possibility for feedback, um, giving your email address with the information is the easiest way, but also using um, social media and asking for um, feedbacks. So for information it's basically the scientists that are um, working to, to produce the knowledge and they inform the others. With consultation, it's still the scientists that uh, do a lot of the knowledge production, but they take into account perspectives from other actors, from their stakeholders. Um, with co-production, on the other hand, then um, it's really co-producing, as the word says, um, that means that you're not coming already with a pro product or a text or something, but you're really um, working on um, developing something with you, together with your stakeholders and people from other disciplines. So to give you an idea about the uh, um, transdisciplinary research process, um, unlike other more classical approaches is where science only interacts in the end when, when results are ready um, with stakeholders. 
transdisciplinary projects involve stakeholders already from the beginning and through all the phases, which I now will go through the three phases. So some important steps for all the three phases. The first phase is the goal and problem framing phase, where you decide on what your topic is, what your um, life world questions are, what your research questions are. So it's very important to have an overview of the actor actors in the field and the context that's relevant to your topic. So that's the only way to find relevant stakeholders for your project. Next point is to collaboratively define life world problems with the stakeholders. What are the problems that should be addressed with your project? What are the goals that should be addressed? And then develop subsequently the research question according to these goals. So it's important to build a collaborative research team with a representative of the disciplines that are necessary to tackle um, your topic. Um, and it's also important to enhance the competences for inter- and trans research processes um, like facilitation, like designing uh, processes, like working together with non-academic actors. So, and then it's important to design a framework, a plan, how to, how you will um, address the collaborative knowledge production. In the kind of main phase of the project, um, where you produce the new knowledge, um, it's important to bring from time to time at important points, sometimes depends on your design in, at all stages, bring scientists together with different backgrounds and the stakeholders, but doing this in a structured way, addressing the goals you want to reach. So finding and adjusting methods for the purposes you need to have at the step of the projects you are. Um, bridging concepts or boundary objects that are tangible for all involved actors are very helpful. Um, can be visualizations, for example, can be um, products you're working towards. Um, and as always, it's very important to carefully prepare and facilitate workshops. Um, it's usually better to have somebody facilitating um, workshops than doing it yourself. And it's also important to, to think about and assign and support appropriate roles for practitioners and researchers. Then when, whenever there are results there, can be in the middle and, or at the end of the project, um, it's important to integrate the different results from different disciplines and uh, the stakeholders. On the one hand, to resolve or mitigate the problems addressed, that's the solution-oriented part, the life world oriented part, and on the other hand, to integrate the results into the scientific body, it means to have also scientific output. Then it's important to have products, um, targeted for all of your stakeholders and for science um, and also to co-design or even co-produce the respective products with exponents from the target groups. And as you have until now invested quite a lot of effort and time to form groups that um, work in a trustful way that have um, um, mutual understanding of each other. It's worth about thinking about follow-up projects or platform to build long-term cooperation with, with this or with just some of the stakeholders. So that's already what I have to say to the process. So as I said, it's just scratching on the surface of transdisciplinarity, but I want to present you some resources. Um, from where you can start um, more explorations into transdisciplinary uh, research and methods. One is the TDNets toolbox where we um, grouped, it's now about 12 methods for knowledge co-production and it's growing. Then our website where you also can subscribe to the newsletter uh, and 
then I have two papers I like to start with in, into the field of transdisciplinarities. One is of Lang et al, Transdisciplinary Research in Sustainable Science, Practice, pr Principles and Challenges. On this I also based this three phases um, tasks. Then the Christian Paul's paper, What is Progress in Transdisciplinary Research, also summarizes quite nice some important points of transdisciplinary research. If you'd rather like a book, um, the Principles for Designing transdisciplinarity, uh, transdisciplinary Research is a nice one. Uh, and I also included one example of integration methods, as I pointed out, that it's quite important to integrate the different knowledge uh, of Florina Schneider et al. It's the sustainability wheel. Um, these resources will afterwards all be on the future of website. So thank you for your attention. That's it for my part. That's great, Tobias. Thank you very much. Um, that was yeah. That was uh, that was even better second time round because as I say, I saw watch, watched it this morning. So um, so thank you thank you for that. Um, we have uh, some time now uh, for questions. Um, this is maybe a little bit different to some of the um, uh, the formats you use, the platforms you've used used before. So what you have to do is wave your hand. So if you have a question, then please raise your hand to uh, start people off to just check that everybody's working. Can you um, please all raise your hands? So that I can just see who's who's there, who's who's hearing. Okay, that's great. There's lots of hands up. Right now, everybody, put their hands down, please. That's super. We can see that the, that everything's working nicely. Um, and uh, so now, please only keep your hand up if you would like to ask a question. Right at the top of my list is Dave Oram. Dave, would you like your, to ask your question? Oh no, Dave's taking his, question, his hand down. Um, next down the list is Julia Klein has put her quest, has put her hand up. Julia, I'm now unmuting you, and you have the microphone now. So please ask your question. Oh, sorry, my hand is down. <laughs> oh, okay, that's okay. It's it's not so easy for me to see here either. That's fine. I shall take your hand down. Um, then. Uh, Marcella, uh, you had your hand up. I am unmuting you now. Please ask your question. Yes. Can you hear? I, I'm we hear here. you perfectly. Okay. So, yes, I have the following questions. When you talk about um, bringing results of routine, how do you deal with the problem of integration? I could, I could imagine that when you have very different frames and framings and disciplinary backgrounds, you will have to deal with a lot of issues of ambiguities, confusions, or maybe even conflict about what's the issue to be resolved. How do you deal with that? Yeah, thank you for the question, Marcella. Um, there's two things I want to say to this. Um, one is that's one of the reasons that not only when bringing the results to fruition it's important to start with the cooperation but already before. So um, deliberately discussing goals, issues and getting knowledgeable also about the topics, the interests and the discipline of the other um, participants in your projects including the stakeholder, very important to get this understanding of each other. Um, nevertheless, um, it, there are quite some methods. Uh, I can't go into detail. I gave one method, the sustainability wheel, um, which is an integration method. Um, well, Oh, do you want, sorry, I'll give you the screen back. I took it away from you, Tobias. Ah, I shall, okay. yeah. Sorry, that was me. I was a bit um, early. I shall no, present no. Here we go. Back to you. Mm -hmm. So it's also in the resources, uh, which it's also paper um, where you can read about how the project Montanaqua um, dealt with integrating uh, 
broad set of disciplinary knowledge and also stakeholders' um, views and visions. So that's just, um, I can't go into detail now, but there are methods and it's, uh, it has to be designed for the different projects. Does this answer your question a bit? Thank you very much, Marcelo, for your question and Tobias for your answer. I'm going to um, be a completely unfair chair and um, issue apologies to Daniela, uh, Helbrun, uh, John Padgham, uh, Marcelo again if you have your hand up again and Roxanne again um, because we have uh, the other presentations to get in but the reason that I'm um, taking your questions uh, asking you to ask your questions later is so that we can have a, a good all-round discussion um, so my apologies but I promise to come back to you and raise your hands uh, when we uh, come to the discussion session at the end so I am now going to make uh, Tanya the presenter um, Tanya, you are hopefully becoming a presenter, and I'm unmuting you. And I will just switch off Tobias and mute Tobias. So, Tanya, I can see your screen. I can't yet see you. Okay. Should I perhaps press the share in our webcam? I'll do that now. Thank you. I have to say, I didn't have a hand. I don't see where the hand is, maybe because I was somehow, you know, chucked out of the thing. I don't know. But I don't have a hand, so tell me at some point where the hand is. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, uh, moving on, so um, as Tobias explained, um, well, he's really the researcher on these things and represents that part. We represent a Future of Finland, which is the National Committee of the Future Earth in Finland, and the European Alliance, so that is the network of European National Committees for Future Earth. And we are doing this from a practical point of view, so we aren't um, scientifically trained. So Tobias' presentation was a really good um, kind of a send-off for us here. And this arrow is what Future Earth sees co-design as. And you can see this comes from the Future Earth Initial Design Report from 2013. And I will not go into any detail here, I'll just note that this um, pretty well matches what Tobias was saying about stakeholder involvement happening already in the beginning, the arrow here represents a lifetime, the lifetime of a research project. But um, we can go into more detail about this later if you like. But the Finnish approach stems from the resources that Tobias mentioned, and in addition to those that he mentioned, we also use a lot of the Biodiversity Stakeholder Engagement Handbook, which is a really excellent source, albeit a little long, but it answers pretty much all your questions um, while you're doing your research. So our approach is that ideally co-design means identifying research questions together and analyzing and interpreting the results coming during the uh, research project. But in practice, this cannot always be done. And at minimum, we always have at least the element of designing the end products together with the user so that the end products uh, whatever they are, reports, infographs, tools, models, that they suit the purposes of the stakeholders and also feel scientifically interesting role. Well. So stakeholders can have multiple roles. They uh, offer complementary data, practitioner knowledge, and real-life limitations for the solution that the research project is trying to produce. Researchers also have roles. Their role is not to um, be a slave to the stakeholder needs, but to ensure that the questions uh, researched um, are of the highest scientific excellence and they are scientifically interesting. They offer the stakeholders and the whole project wider perspectives and timescales. Um, often politicians or um, government officials sometimes have to look at the time between elections, that could be four years, but researchers always can bring in longer timescales and information about the background and interconnectivity of problems. What we aim at in uh, Finland with our uh, approach is to create ownership and also short and long-term societal impacts. Uh, products, tangible products, as I mentioned, network influences, network would impact, better understanding and trust between stakeholders and scientists, capacity building, skills, that are necessary for participatory research. Transformation, uh, sustainability transformation, of course, is the ultimate goal. Decisions, 
structures, policies, these may or may not come in the long term. We can discuss all these things in the discussion phase a little bit deeper. How we do this in practice? We map and group our stakeholders into four different groups that match quite well the different um, interaction inten intensities that Tobias was talking about. We have the informed category here, number four in blue. Just regular informing of project progress via website, social media, sometimes surveys. The consult category in green here usually has in it a variable number of stakeholders that we can solve on relevant issues when necessary or en masse via surveys. For instance, a large number of small and medium-sized enterprises, citizens, consumers. We invite these people to relevant workshops as well. The involved category goes more to the co-production part. Um, there we have regular interaction to ensure that our work is relevant and that we know of time with stakeholder processes. Here we also have people giving input to the co-design of these hip and end products. Um, the collaborate category then has the most essential stakeholders. We are fully engaged. They have priority in the co-design of the research questions and the end, hip and end products. We have meetings regularly. In this case, this is a real-time example. So we have meetings, uh, planned meetings twice a year. Also participation in relevant workshops and meetings. Um, without going into detail, I'll just show that we have different ways of working with these different groups of stakeholders. Going from website, social media, to surveys, town hall meetings, practical demonstrations, working groups, steering group if necessary. And here you see the link to the Biodiversity Stakeholder Engagement Handbook. And they, there are uh, all these tables you can find there. Finally, how to plan stakeholder interaction. What we do in the proposal phase, as I said, we often cannot uh, talk very much about the research question. They are quite often already predefined to a degree in our funding instruments. But in the proposal phase, we map the value chain. We identify the actors that are necessary for the best possible results and solutions. Then we organize thematic workshops for them with the researchers where we do elementary mapping of the stakeholder needs within the boundaries of the research. And this is a key point. This mapping of stakeholder needs takes time. They don't usually know exactly what they need, what they want, and especially they don't know what a research project can offer them. So they need to first kind of get acquainted with the researchers and what they are planning to do. So this takes a lot of time. Usually we do get, at some point, Co -design, to co-design the guiding research questions. And after this, we plan a very concrete interaction and communication strategy for co-designing the research and for um, uh, producing the end product and communicating with different audiences. You know, we'll tell you a little bit more about that. We try to give clear roles for stakeholders in this plan. Who gives complementary knowledge on what? Who analyzes and interprets which data? who co-designs which end products, and if possible, we try to organize joint leadership for the stakeholders with researchers on specific tasks. This is sometimes difficult because they all, all are also um, limited by time. And in the research phase, it's pretty easy just stick to the interaction plan. Every step in it must have a purpose that's relevant for the research. Utilize participatory methods in your meetings, workshops, town halls. Like Tobias said, this is where you might want to use professionals until you learn the ropes yourself, and create a public profile for the research through continuous communication. And uh, Ina will tell you more about this. Um, Asha, did you want some questions at this point, about this part? Yes, please. If we could um, do the same, if you wanted to raise your hand. Um, probably I'm only going to allow one question, so be fast with your hand. Um, and the question to be specifically to Tanya as well, please we'll have a much wider discussion once Ina has completed. Uh, John, you've raised your hand. You were the first. Um, so, John, I'm just unmuting you now. You have the microphone. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, just a point of clarification. You mentioned um, from a practical standpoint, what you're really able to achieve mostly is co-design with input in terms of products coming out of it. Is that right? Well, what I meant was that if you look at this arrow here, um, ideally co-design starts already at this joint framing of the topic. Also what Tobias said, what is good, uh, whatever the good is that we are trying to achieve. We in Finland, this might change, be very different in, 
in the countries, but in Finland we have a couple of funding instruments that we can use for this kind of work, and they do predefine the questions to quite a you know large degree. So we can't go into co-design at this point usually, but we can co-design the research scale and the you know more detailed research questions. Thank you. Um, that was a, a quick question and a, a quick answer, so thank you very much. Um, Marcella, your hand raised again. I'm giving you the microphone if you would like to ask a supplementary question. Yes, Tanya, and how is the selection of stakeholders done? Who gets in? Who gets in? It's more like who do we get in? <laughs> who can we reach in time? As, a, as I mentioned, again, this is uh, about a very practical uh, limitation on time. We usually get the themes for these funding instruments I mentioned about one or two months before the deadline. So then we have to first try and formulate, form the, the interdisciplinary research group. We need to talk with them, what kind of stakeholders we think would be relevant, and then we try to divide the labor so that, you know, uh, who tries to contact who. So it's really a race against time in our case. But, of course, in other, you know, situations it might be different. But we usually, the researchers usually have a pretty good idea of what sort of direction they want to go, what kind of stakeholders they want to involve, but then that's again a question of skills. If they are not used to talking with stakeholders, they might be a little shy, they, they need to be able to sell their research a little bit, and there needs to be some funding so that the stakeholders don't have to put in a dime, because that's not something they usually want to do. So it's a, it's a race against time, I have to say, but in these cases that we've been involved in, we've managed to get a really good um, group of stakeholders, and you can see one example right here. It depends entirely on the topic, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Marcella, for your question, and thank you, Tanya, for your answer. Um, I will now uh, pass over to uh, Ina. Ina, I'm now making you the presenter, and I am unmuting you. So you have the mic and uh, there we go. I can see your presentation. Okay, thank you, Asher. So my name is, is Ina Koskinen and I work with Tanja Suni in Future Finland. I'm going to talk to you about research communication and then present you a research project in which Future at Finland acts as an interaction partner. So, research communication is an integral, integral part of co-design. In a way, co-design is communication with different uh, communication and interaction with different audiences. When you start planning your communication, remember that communication takes time. Therefore, it's good to design a detailed communication plan and stick to it. You might get carried away by your research, uh, and when you do your research, and you might not, Sometimes you don't find the time to do the communication, so that's why it's important to have the plan, and it kind of helps you to allocate your resources for the communication. Sometimes it's good to have professional help from, for example, uh, communication uh, professionals, companies, but uh, I would emphasize that you are the expert and you have created the links for your stakeholders, so it's, it's important that the researchers also do communication in research proje projects. And one starting point also is that good media coverage doesn't necessarily equal the largest impact. Sometimes you can get more impact by communicating directly with, for example, two policymakers than you would instead of uh, having making a lot of press releases and getting your news, getting your research through the news. So when you start planning, oh, what happened? Oh, sorry, I think I. Yeah. So when you start planning your communications, it's important to identify your stakeholders. Who should know about your research in different phases of research and who would provide you largest impact? And then you should define your key messages in plain English and you should think what is useful information for your stakeholders. It's also important that you start sharing your knowledge already in the beginning of the project and in different phases of the project. For example, you can share infographics, visualizations, write a column or an opinion piece. And then you should choose your communication channels twicely. Uh, for example, you could use Twitter, research blog or online portals. So, how to go public? 
uh, when, you do, when you have a limited amount of time, you should make the most out of your content. That means that create content for your home page or, or your research blog and distribute parts of it via multiple channels. It's also important to try to balance between project and personal communication profile. For example, social media channels are not very good, good channels for doing project communication and, and it's better to, for example, tweet as a person. And also take profit of your stakeholders' communication channels because they will give you uh, audiences that you would not have in the beginner, beginning of the process. So a few words about research blogs. You should publish regularly uh, at least one post per, per week or, or every two weeks. And you can have various options for topics from your, starting from your own research content to the latest developments in your field or reports from the conferences you attend or organize. And you can also comment on timely conversations and events. And in research blogging, it's always remember that you should write in plain language because research blog is both for the fellow scientists and lay audiences. And try to keep it sh short, half page or one page at maximum. And choose your social media channels according to your stakeholders. At least in Finland, decision makers and journalists follow Twitter, so it, that's a good way to reach them. But whereas in Facebook, uh, audiences may take a long time to build, and you can try to be active in different Facebook groups. And also, Instagram is a nice uh, way to build atmosphere and share pictures of your projects, for example, from the field trips. Uh, I'm not going to go to this Twitter crash course here, but I just want to emphasize that Future has, Future has held really nice webinars on communication, and you can see here the link to those webinars, and there are tips for Twitter blog, blogging and visualizations. So now to our example case. So uh, Future at Finland acts as an interaction partner in this uh, project called Stewart's Water Smart Circular Economy. So it's a one-year research project. And our role is to coordinate interaction and provide also co-design training for the scientists. Uh, this uh, project started with co-design already in the beginning. Uh, the scientists co-designed research proposal with their stakeholders. And they used this stakeholder mapping and prioritizing that Tanya explained earlier. Uh, this project set up a stakeholder advisory board that includes ministries, NGOs, think tanks, technology industry interest groups. And this really helps to, to gain wider audiences and use their networks and channels. And, for, and these stakeholders have, for example, hosted these project workshops. And this project also gets external communication support from a science uh, communication company. And this company has helped the researchers to build their profiles, especially in social media. And, and encourage, encourage them to tweet and, and blog actively on the project website and also on the stakeholders website. So here you can see the interaction plan of, of this one year project. We started with a kickoff uh, meeting and we, host, uh, we held this, um, this meeting in, a, in a one of the stakeholders uh, venue and this way we got their audiences. And we already, in the very beginning, we wrote an entry on circular economy to the Wikipedia because there wasn't one in Finnish. And then we attended one of our stakeholders, Technology Industries Circular Economy Day and uh, gave a workshop there. And then also we went to the countryside to this food production company's factory and held workshops there with the local uh, businessmen and farmers. And now in May and June we are pub um, publishing uh, infographs on the water use in Finland. This is kind of the mid-term product of, of this research project. And then later this year we will have um, regulation and policy workshops and our final seminar that we will hold with the one big Finnish think tank uh, called CITRA. And all along the year uh, the researchers have been actively doing co-design and they've been of course interviewing their stakeholders and been active in contacting them in the seminars and in other networking events. And the communication have been also active, especially uh, online and in, on Twitter. 
And what is uh, special in this project is that the project is taking use of the stakeholders' own networks and organizes seminars with them and in their own seminars. And Future at Finland has been the facilitator and, and, um, and an external help in this workshop. As Tanya said, uh, sometimes the scientists don't know how to do that or they don't have time, time to do the co-design part. So it's, it's good that there's an external uh, person or a boundary organization that facilitates the workshops. And as communication um, products, we have produced uh, press releases, policy briefs, this infograph, many different blogs on our own website and on the visitor blogs, and also written this circular economy entry. And then we don't have our own newsletter, but we, uh, we take advantage of this um, newsletter by the Forum for Environmental Information. Uh, it's like an established uh, boundary organization that has wide audiences. So instead of making our own newsletter, we use their news. We have a column in their newsletter. So this was very shortly my talk. So if you have any questions, I'm ready to answer them. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ina. Um, so we've had, I think, a really nice. Uh, sweet and set of talks and uh, thanks to um, Future Earth Finland, the European Alliance for putting those together. Um, so we had Tobias obviously coming in um, from a sort of uh, quite a conceptual um, foundations laying the, the groundwork, uh, Tanya taking it to uh, specific Finnish case studies for, for uh, co-production engagement and then um, Ina working more on engagement as sort of the wider communication perhaps less expert communication required for other expert stakeholders. So now is the time uh, for questions and again uh, my apologies to everybody um, for, um, uh, for who I took the, the, the microphones off and took their hands down. So I'm going to bring back the speakers for questions. Um, Ina, you um, either didn't switch your camera on or accidentally switched it off. Um, I don't so know what happened, but let's see. Uh, yeah, it would be lovely to see you again. Okay, I'm here. Yeah, you're coming back. And uh, Can Kabir you see still my screen? Is here, and yes, uh, well, hopefully it's my screen now. Um, okay. You can yeah. see my, my screen. And um, John is the person with his hand up, so he's good at this um, first one in. Um, so I'm giving you the microphone, John. There we go, we can hear you. Thank you, Asher. Um, very interesting presentations. This is a question, I think, mostly for Tobias. It has to do with the amount of relationship building and trust building that goes into doing true transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary research. And from your experience, who, who are the societal partners uh, that, that the research community engages with as intermediaries, intermediaries to, uh, to construct a transis transdisciplinary type of engagement? Uh, are there boundary organizations? Uh, where is the demand coming from that would allow uh, a researcher to reach out in a partnership uh, type of design? Um, that's a question I can't answer in general because it really depends on where you have your life world goals in the project. Um, what stakeholders um, are interested in, in what you're doing then and what stakeholders you need to, to do your work. Um, we worked quite a lot with uh, authorities and um, also I, I would say the legislative part of policy making because they also have the time frames that are long enough to um, work with science. Um, but they don't usually work with specific um, boundary organizations. This may be because Switzerland is quite small, so we work directly with, the, um, for example, the um, National Office for Environment or Nas National Office for, for um, Energy or others, or in the regional actors anyways are, are quite accessible. So in regional case studies, it's usually not so difficult to find really interested stakeholders that are willing to invest some time if you design the processes in a way that also the interests of the um, stakeholders are met. 
Um, on national level, it also works. International, it's a step more difficult to get to work with international organizations. But some international organizations are also open to, to work with scientists in long going projects. Uh, thank you, uh, Tobias. Um, John, may I ask you to perhaps offer us an insight into your own question because you yourself work very much in, in this realm. So I think um, I and others would be interested in your, your angle on that. Well, just to clarify, I don't work a lot in this realm, but I, my organization is beginning to engage in this realm. Uh, through, through some collaborations with Stellenbosch University and others on TD training. Uh, and, but one of the issues that we've come up, we've come up with in our work with stakeholders in, in research and others is legit, legitimacy and credibility. Uh, and it just takes a long time to establish trust and how do you sustain that trust after the infusion of money from a project uh, allows one to, to do a particular set of activities because one of the frustrations we run up against is the sort of one-off type of situation. Uh, we worked with um, city officials from five different cities looking at peri-urban land change and climate risks uh, and we really wanted to, and there was so much enthusiasm, we really wanted to build this into a larger engagement but it was only one, one project that allowed that to happen because of the funding. So that was the uh, source of my question question is this difficult issue of trust building and relationship building, who, who are the kinds of partners that you've seen in the TD space that really worked? And I, and I certainly agree to Tobias that it's not, that's very case specific, but I'm just curious if you had some examples and thank you for providing that. Um, well, I would have quite some examples, but that kind of uh, explodes the time frame. I really much like to interact maybe in, in the workshops and giving a bit more examples. But I would say it's more the process than the actors. So depending on what actors you have, you have really to design the process and design the workshops properly, thinking about how could you engage with all of them in a trust building way. Um, it's not an easy task and it uh, takes a lot of time to do it, but it's worth I, it. I, I will add that, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll come to you. I will add that um, uh, in addition, so th as I said in instruction, this is one of a six. And so um, if participants here and from this morning um, have areas that you would like to be investigated deeper or further with, with follow-up webinars, then um, uh, there's the physical meeting in Stockholm, but also we can we can do this through webinars as well, um, so that we're uh, sort of building up this uh, conceptual conceptual background over time. Um, Tanya, you had a um, you wanted to make a comment, and then after that, yeah. I'm coming to Julia Klein, who's very patiently been waiting. So Tanya, if you wouldn't mind being um, short. Absolutely. So just uh, agreeing with Tobias and uh, John, there needs to be as Tobias put it in his presentation, some sort of follow-up, either projects or platforms that build these long-term collaboration uh, spaces where this trust can be built. And uh, we've been saying for quite a long time that future national committees could provide such a uh, platform. We've experimented with that in Finland. Switzerland has done this for a long time. And we feel that there needs to be a, 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 a larger culture change um, about how scientists and stakeholders find each other. It needs to be easy, it needs to be simple, and it needs to be part of every day in a way. So there needs to be a bigger conceptual and bigger practical change in this culture. And for that, we need these platforms. And Future can provide those platforms, also internationally, I think. Thank you, Tanya. I am now coming to you, Julia. Thank you for being patient. And I am giving you the microphone. You have the microphone. Great, thank you. Um, I have a very practical question for Lena on communications. I was curious as to why it's better to tweet as an individual and not as a project or an organization, because I would think you could tailor your tweets more specifically to your stakeholders if you were um, doing so on behalf of this a project or an organization. So just curious about that. Yeah. Yeah, so of course, I mean, I, I would say that it depends on the length of your project. Uh, for example, our project was only a one-year project, and in general, a research project 
uh, end at some point. So I therefore, see. it's I mean to get more um, to get the science heard in society. It's important that the researchers come out and build their public communication profile and become experts and stakeholders know to whom to turn to when they want to know about something. And, and, and as I said already in my presentation that social media channels, especially Facebook and Twitter, are more or less built for these uh, persons. So they don't work that well with organize, organizations. But of course, I mean, if, you're very, if your organization is very known, then, then it's easier to build audiences. But if you start um, a completely new research project, it will take a long time to build your audience. So that's why it may be better that your researchers tweet as a person and then use a, a specific hashtag that means this identification symbol for the project. This is my recommendation, but of course there can be different views on this as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia, for your question. I'm now coming to uh, Vivi Stavro. Um, you have the microphone, Vivi. We possibly have microphone problems. Okay, I'll pass on from Vivi. I will make um, contact with her separately in the chat box. Um, but uh, Daniela has, uh, Helbrun has put her hand up. So, Daniela, I'm uh, coming to you and you now have the microphone. Okay, thank you. I, I raised my hand in the, in the after the first presentation because I wanted to, to ask about the co-production and the co-design because I, I can feel that the starting point to, to, to have a common definition of the problem and then the research question should be the hardest point. And, and Tanya also said that the joint framing and the research definition should, can take time and you, you should take the time. And, and I would ask for really practical information on how to go about how are there frameworks for, for creating co-designing that you can use interacting with stakeholders so you don't just bring your own ideas and, and research questions and really carefully listen to, to what the stakeholders want. Are there frameworks for, for building this co-design? <clears throat> there, there are kind of frameworks but um, it's a uh, very iterative phase, this um, problem framing phase. So somebody has an idea, talks with colleagues with it, thinking about who could be involved in further shaping this, um, what stakeholders could be in, interested in discussing this question further on. Um, then maybe at some point make a proposition of uh, of a project, discuss this again with the stakeholders, ask the stakeholders about their needs, um, look what the scientists could do about this. So it's, it's very iterative, so um, it's usually done in several steps. Uh, and again, um, it depends uh, on, on your um, starting point, if it's a, a field where already um, projects happened where you already know a little bit uh, the, the context and the stakeholders, the important ones, or maybe you have just to start from when you have an idea to look about the, the system and the stakeholders who could be important and also the scientific colleagues and disciplines that could be important to address um, the topic. Yes, thank you. I would really like it if you have any further pop-up webinars, real examples of how, how different projects have done this, because it would be interesting to really see that process, not just the outcome, but the, the process. Thank um, you. Just, just one word to this. Um, at November 7th, there is the Swiss Transdisciplinarity Day in Lucerne. I don't know where you're um, living, but just if you're not too far away, it deals exactly with the framing phase, and at least then um, some presentations or so can be downloaded afterwards. So, yeah. thank you, Tobias and Daniela. I'm going to uh, Tanya. You have your hand up. Yes, I have the physical hand because yeah. I don't have the electronic yeah, hand. You also have the microphone, so you can. <laughs> oh, okay. Wait. Just a comment on what uh, the, this discussion. I think it's a, a good question. And I'd like to go back with, uh, to what Tobias said about this 
going to be iterative. Uh, this brings me to uh, what to be said in the morning session about democracy and balance. Sometimes that is difficult to achieve. That's why you need sometimes participatory methods because at the end of the day, um, pro design is about listening to what other people have to say and opening your mind and being open to other ideas than just your own. And sometimes there are people who are very strong and they, they need to be kind of balanced so that everybody's voice is heard. This is what to be said in the morning. It might be nice to hear it a little bit more about this here. But I'd like to ask a question uh, also from Tobias and everybody here. This iterativeness is clearly easiest to do locally. You know, when you're in the same city, for instance, you can go back to your stakeholders easier. You can call them up. Uh, you're in the same time zone, same language, everything. We have an example uh, where we're working in an international setting. And in my experience, it's much more difficult because you organize one big workshop, people come in there from different parts of the world. It's really hard to then be iterative there. So to be to be as you sent some uh, examples of email, I will get to know them, but could you maybe say something about this? Mm -hmm. On an international mm -hmm. setting. A future of needs to be international as well as local. Yeah, yeah. Well, um also an international uh, level some kind of iterativeness is possible, but um in this case, it's often um, you're talking personally with uh, different people, different stakeholders, different colleagues on different uh, continents even, and uh, developing from this point on, and then maybe nevertheless have just one meeting where we try to bring all this together, and then maybe send out um, uh, first draft of a proposal and have more like a, then it's more like a consulting. It's, it's easier to work in the consulting mode than in the co-production mode, that's for sure, but important to have, for example, this one workshop where you co-produce some of the core ideas of the project, but have the other iterative, cir iterative circles in a consulting mode, which can be done easier over the continents. Thank you all for uh, question and answers. Um, Vivi uh, Stavro, who tried to answer a question before, we think her mic is working. Um, so I'm giving you the mic, Vivi. Could you try again, yes, please? Can you hear me? Oh, that's perfect. Thank you very much. Please, could you ask your question? Yes, hi. I wanted to ask um, about a general question about transdisciplinary research generally. and. Um, do we label all research that consults stakeholders as TD research, if that's what the researchers request of us to do, especially um, as funders, regardless of the depth of the stakeholder engagement, or, or do we apply stricter definitions of TD? I'm asking this because in our highly competitive funding infrastructure, um, our institutions, um, in, within a sort of donor-funded project management, management conditions, co-design is pretty rare actually, um, and you do tend to find more consultation around co-production, um, and so that's the question. That's an excellent question, thank you for asking it. I shall pass it on to the panel, even though I have my own ideas. <laughs> <laughs> this one's for Tobias, he's the researcher. Okay, the yeah, so um, I'm a bit hesitating on giving sharp edges to what is transdisciplinary and what not, but um, I would really hesitate to say a project is transdisciplinary if it only um, works with information and a little bit of, uh, of, of consultation. It really also go to these four principles, grasping the complexity, so it you usually need to involve several um, stakeholders, several disciplines. Um, it's also there are other forms of uh, like the research and development where you just uh, develop something for the good of maybe one company that I wouldn't call transdisciplinary because it's not directed to the to the common good. So working with these principles helps me to to look is this transdisciplinary project. But in the end, um, it's for me it's not a question, is this transdisciplinary or not, but is this the right um, process setting 
to reach the goals the project addresses and also to reach the life world goal the process uh, the project addresses so it's important to know about the life world goals where exactly does the project want to contribute to life world and not only to know the research questions but also to look if these two are linked really good uh, that's really uh, yeah, that's really interesting uh, answer. Actually, I shall look into that myself. And thank you, Vivi, for the for the question as well. Um, we are right on the hour by the second, which means I'm the perfect producer of this program. Um, so I would like to uh, thank you all for participating. We've done, even if I say so myself, enormously well. We've reached out to 90 different people. Um, in, in 90 different places, 90 different offices. Um, I have somebody talking to me um, in the chat box from Mexico. Um, you know, we've, I think uh, you know, this just shows the power of hopefully interesting webinars um, and also the power of the internet for sharing knowledge far wider than we could do. You know, when would we possibly have got all these people together to have a physical workshop of 90 people from 90 places? we'd never be able to afford that and it would be impossible. Um, so do please uh, carry on to pioneer digital ways of communication within Future Earth and Future Earth Europe. And uh, please do um, send any of your uh, feedback to us. It's a series, we, would, we will carry on this series. We are very open to, um, to, to what we do uh, continuing on in the series. The resources from these talks, the presentations themselves, they have been recorded. Uh, Tobias's resource page will all be posted on the Future Earth Europe website, futureeartheurope.org forward slash resources. That will bring you to um, th this information all about co-production. The page is there already. I just need to populate it with these um, talks and this content. So I thank you all very much and of course I thank uh, Future Earth Finland, the uh, European Alliance for National Committees, Tobias for joining us from the Transdisciplinary Network. Do look out for our future webinars and uh, advertising of our, our physical workshop in, in, no, in November. Um, so thank you Tania, thank you Ina, thank you Tobias and thank you everybody for joining. Um, I've been Asher Mins, and I wish you all good morning or good night, depending on where you are in the world. Goodbye now. Bye. Thank you so much, Asher. Thank, thank you. Yes, buddy. Thank you, Asher. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.